Joining us today on the Chicks on the Right podcast is none other than our friend and sponsor, Zach Abraham, uh, Chief Investment Officer at Bulwark Capital Management. And you were telling us some stuff before we even started recording. He's spilling that the tea. It was making our like brains there's explode. Tea. I feel and like so we were like, yeah, please stop talking. We've got to save this. Everybody needs to hear this. Uh-huh. And go. Go. <laughs> okay. So, we, so. We'll start it off with this, and and I think that this is so important for retail investors. And when when I say retail investors, um, I mean anybody. I don't mean that in a pejorative term, right? Retail, you know, people look down on it. There's some really good retail investors that you know invest their own money, but watching what retail investors do is is a very big signal for us and any other institutional money manager. And the reason why is historically retail investors are wonderful contra indicators, okay? Meaning when you see records selling from retail, so if, if retail are just in there dumping stocks, about 95% of the time, that's a bottom, okay? It's a wonderful time to be buying. Conversely, and if we think back to the tech bubble of 1999, right? Where you couldn't go to a cocktail party or go to somebody's barbecue without talking about the hot new tech play that they were in, right? right? When we see peaks, in retail investor sentiment, so so they're very aggressively purchasing stocks. That typically coincides with either cyclical or secular tops, meaning it's it's either you know a top for a short period of time, uh, and the market's going to correct, or it's the top of a cycle, right? And and we all know this, you know, anecdotally, people get the most excited about buying stocks when they've gone up the most. And people get the most demoralized about buying stocks when they've gone down the most, right? We think inversely to what we should. So we pay very close attention to these indicators. And I, we've talked a lot about how expensive this market is, right? How interest rates are going up, bad things are happening in the economy and stocks keep going up and valuations get stretched. Well, some really interesting data came out the other day. I believe it was actually yesterday or the day before that in this so far in this quarter, you are seeing record inflows. So as in retail investors have never been more aggressively purchasing stocks than they have been this quarter. Okay. Now at the same time, let's contrast that with what's happening on the other side of it. We got a report out every single year, anybody that every single quarter, any, any manager or company that manages over a hundred million dollars has to file something we call a 13 F which they have to report what they bought and sold that quarter and what they currently own. And we keep a big eye on that. Like for instance, Warren Buffett or Stan Druckenmiller, those are guys who we watch their 13 mm-hmm. apps. It's part of our process, part of our research process to just see what some of the greatest investors in the world are doing. Right? So in the same quarter that retail investors are buying more aggressively than they ever have, the news comes out that over the last 12 months, Warren Buffett has been a net seller of $30 billion in stock and currently has a record $150 billion in cash sitting on his balance sheet. What so, does that mean? Yeah. Well, well, so what it means is that he, he has $150 billion sitting there in cash, i.e. short-term U.S. government bonds, waiting to buy something. Why isn't he buying things right now? Warren Buffett. If you don't see Warren Buffett buying things when he's got a lot of cash on his balance sheet, it's because he thinks they're ridiculously expensive, right? He's, he, he does the opposite of what retail investors do. When things get stupid expensive, he sells them. He actually, he and Charlie Munger, his, his, uh, his long-term partner, they have a saying, which is we want to buy things when nobody wants them. And we want to sell them when everybody can't live without them. Right. Hmm. So they are doing when you see those core. Now, look, all of this is anecdotal and Buffett has been wrong before. Right. But when we're sitting there talking about how ridiculous this market is in contrast to the backdrop, all of these things are lining up. Right. You've got the most deeply inverted yield curve of all time. Whenever it's been like this, you've had a recession within 12 to 16 months. Yeah. And we're right about that 12 to 16 month point from when the curve inverted. If we were at the top of the cycle, we would expect to see record inflows from retail. Check. We would expect to see really seasoned investors like Buffett. And we would like to, I'm, I'm not putting ourselves in Buffett's category, but there's a reason why we're sitting on about 25 to 35% short-term treasuries too. Why? These prices and market moves make no sense. Okay. Companies who are losing increasingly more money, their stock is going up increasingly fast. Okay. So 
you just look at all of this stuff. And what I will tell people is that I look, and this isn't just the overall market. There are some cheap things that I think need to be in people's portfolios, mm -hmm. i.e. the stuff that Warren Buffett has actually been buying. The only thing he has purchased over the last 16 months, essentially in a meaningful amount, right? is energy companies, Exxon and Occidental, uh, Occidental Petroleum. So, and, and ironically, that's the only stuff we've been buying too, because as crazy as these other prices are, you look at a lot of that stuff that benefits from inflation and it is generationally cheap. It, it's so cheap. It doesn't make any sense, right? Wow. So you, you just have this crazy market that I think people just believe that tech stocks can't lose and that's how they're going to get rich quick. And um, they're being price agnostic, meaning they're not paying attention to the underlying fundamentals. Companies that are losing money, or excuse me, not losing, like Apple isn't losing money, but Apple's back to an all-time high and an all-time high valuation. And this is coming off the first period in 20 years where they've had three consecutive quarters of declining earnings and revenue and rates are going up, right? So it, to us, guys, these are the kind of things that you see at the end of the longest bull market in human in, in, in U.S. history, the biggest bull market in U.S. history. Every time things went down over the last for 15 years, right, the only way you lost was by, by not buying the dip, right? So are, is there going to be – I keep hearing the term thrown around – soft landing, <laughs> which sounds very nice. So yeah. what's your take on that? Are we going to crash and burn or is there going to be a soft landing? Yeah. So I think the soft landing thing is hilarious. I remember the same terms <laughs> being thrown out in 2008, right? Soft landing. That was not soft. Yeah, mm -hmm. not at all. And, and, mm -hmm. and, here's, and here's why we think, now look, full caveat. Um, and, and I think this is just a lesson to everybody listening right now. Anytime you hear me or anybody else that does this for a living, tell you what they think, know full well that me and anybody else you listen to does not have some secret information and does not know the future, right? So I can be wrong too. But when we look at a soft landing, I actually on the face of it, find it ridiculous. Okay. And the reason I find it ridiculous is the whole idea of a soft landing is the economy slows gently and it allows the Fed to cut. Okay. Well, why is the Fed going to cut if nothing bad is happening? Right? Everything like, is bad. Every everything is happening that's bad right now, and they keep raising rates. Right. Yeah. Right. And yeah. The reason they, and, and and the reason they keep raising rates is due to what we call the leg effect, meaning this happens every cycle too. What ha Fed starts raising rates, everybody freaks out for four to six months. Then they kind of pop their heads up and go, "Hey, nothing really bad has happened. The coast is clear." And interest rate hikes never hit the real economy. It takes 12 to 16 months for them to filter through. So we're right at that point now. And, and it, it, the other part of it is it just fits all up anecdotally. What, what we look at record retail exuberance about buying stocks is occurring right as the impacts from higher interest rates are starting to show up in the economy. I'm just right. waiting for the interest rates to stop r rising. <laughs> well, they, they're, pro they're we're probably close to it right now. Are we? Okay. Yeah. I thought that they just said that they were going to do another one. And I'm like, my they, God. <laughs> they may I'm on like, the really? margins, right? But I mean, if they throw another 25 basis points at it, what's the difference? <laughs> right? Like it, it's, it's 25 bips, so it's not going to really matter. Here's the other thing that I don't think people are realizing. Economically, if the Fed cuts 50 to even 100 basis points, It'll probably make the stock market go up in the interim, but it really isn't. It, and it might bring mortgage rates down a little too. But other than that, it's not going to really do anything positive. And the reason for that is, is, is the biggest wind economically that's provided through lower interest rates is the ability it provides consumers and corporations to refinance their debt at lower levels. Okay, well, if the Fed cuts 100 basis points, which would be a very large cut, you're still way above where we've been for the last 15 years. So it's not going to trigger any refinancing because that means you'd be going into a higher rate, right? So this is our whole point is we think the Fed will cut aggressively, but not until bad things start to happen. And if you want to see an example of that, just look at every recession for the last 40 years. Does the Fed cut? Yes, but it's usually after something breaks, right? The Fed is reactive. They're not predictive, right? They're not getting out ahead of things. So they're, they're a totally reactive body. And so, yeah, I, I just, and when you think of it that way, it's to me, the whole, and, and to our analysts and everybody that we've got here, um, 
I just think it looks like a very, it's like a, a children's story, right? A soft landing. It sounds nice. Is it going to happen? No, the, the <laughs> feds never pulled it off before. Right. That's so, great. I mean, you know, could that, could that pig grow wings and fly off the farm? I suppose it could. I'm not going to say it's impossible, <laughs> but it's never happened. Uh... So that, that's, that's the, that, that's the way we view it. And I think that's just a lot of stuff going on right now is people are looking at data points that line up with what they think. And I just don't think people are being very realistic about what we're up against. That's, that's great. It's always such a, an uplifting conversation. I know, really. But there is hope here. There is, a, there is silver lining, right? First of all, and I'm not just trying to pump the way we do things, but first of all, we're looking at all these, we're looking at all these gray clouds. You can make more interest now taking zero risk than you've been able to for 16 years. Here, here's the other thing. There are great bargains out there. You just need to know where to look. And here's the other thing. If we manage risk properly, market downturns become opportunities because yeah. we prepare for it. And then we can step in there and buy great assets at cheap prices. So, you know, we tell all of our clients, look, one of the reasons we manage risk and we're constantly looking at protecting your downside is because that means we'll have the most amount of money when things go on sale. And so market devastation will equal our opportunity. And I'm not gloating about that, right? But we we got to do what's best for ourselves and, and and what feels you know what's the most responsible with our money and so I think the I think the upside is you're getting paid more to wait and be conservative now than you have at any time over the last 17 years and we're probably going to see some phenomenal buying opportunities over the next year to two so yeah it's okay, not all gloom okay, that's good yeah you pull a just, Warren Buffett <laughs> yeah well and, and I, unfortunately the stuff that I think looks really good over the next five to ten years is the stuff that nobody owns. They're all loaded mm -hmm. up on Nvidia and AI and Arc and all this tech stuff. It's right. grotesquely and ridiculously overvalued, and they're probably going to get smashed. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah, it makes right. sense. Makes yeah. Complete this is sense. the this is the kind of good information that we always learn from you, and that everyone else can too. If they just go and check out your website, tell people where to find you. Yeah. So, and we actually just started a new one too. So really uh, easy. Okay. Yeah. E easiest place to find us is know your risk radio.com or bulwark, bulwark capital management.com. Cause we do our weekly show that airs on Saturday. And then we've just started an extension to that show. So if you're a subscriber to the podcast, you'll get this automatically. And it's something that we're putting out every single day called daily dots. I, I hope you guys can't hear there. There must be some kind of medical emergency going on in the background or sirens. <laughs> but uh, I, I do live in the Seattle area, right? So there's, you know, there's a lot of that. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. It's like air, air, air raid sirens in Iraq, right? Um, <laughs> but <clears throat> so we put out this every day. It runs about 10 to 15 minutes. It's called Daily Dots. And it's just a condensed down version of everything important that happened in the world of finance, investing and markets and economics that day. And, I love it. Uh, whole idea, yeah, it was just to make it a simple, easy. People on the ride home can get a download of everything that happened of importance that day in a short, concise manner. So uh, that is fantastic. That yes. Everybody should check that out. That is awesome. Zach. Thank you. you and bet. thanks as always for giving us an update and having a happy ending. That was really, really. <laughs> important. Yes. Yeah. Hey, there is hope, right? If it, it uh, uh, favor, or what is it? Opportunity favors those who are prepared. And um, I think it's just a wonderful time to get prepared. Love All it. Right. Good, good message. Thank you, Zach. Appreciate thanks, it. Zach. Ladies, appreciate it as always.